Uh, it's good to be back at your church. Uh, I was here about, spoke maybe 15, 20 years ago. By the way, I like your haircut, man. Hey, yeah. For those of you that have known me over the years, I had long, I used to have red hair. I don't know what happened. It's not old age, I'm sure. But anyway, I got tired of a ponytail and, and uh, uh, went to the barber and I said, let's cut this thing off and we'll send a, the, the red hair to locks of love so maybe some little girl with cancer can get uh, a wig out of it. And I said, I, I want I want a flat top haircut. I want to land a Cessna 150 right up here on top. And I've been wearing it ever since, okay? It's easy to take care of. Uh, but it is good to be here with you. Good to see a lot of folks out uh, uh, worshiping the Lord this morning. That is so awesome. And I've noticed some Asian people and black people and red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. And you know what we have here this morning? The kingdom of God. Amen. That's the kingdom of God. Amen. It certainly is. As a Southern Baptist uh, evangelist, I wear quite a few hats. I, I like to go where the need is. And uh, we do a lot of street ministry with the drug addicts and the street people and um, motorcycle ministry. Uh, we do a lot of the bike rallies. We go to Daytona every year. We've got a rally we've been going to for 20 years in Red River, New Mexico in the, in the mountains. And minister to the bikers uh, where we go and, and uh, uh, do a lot of jail and prison ministry. And I remember about, oh, six years ago, I asked one of my warden buddies in Angola, Louisiana, and they've got a couple of television shows out about Angola. Uh, but I asked him, I said, what can we do at Christmas time for the death row inmates? Because I've been going into that prison for about 22 years. And... Um, so I, I mentioned a few things. He said, no, 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 security, security, security. And uh, I said, well, how about socks? They're on a, they're, they're on a, a concrete floor, 24-7, 365. How about wool blend socks? He said, you can do that. And I said, how about a candy cane? And uh, how many of you know the story behind the candy cane? Awesome. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ is what a candy cane uh, was originated as to share the good news. The red blood of Jesus uh, makes us, you know, white as snow and, and the shepherd's staff. And we, we give that candy cane away to each one of the inmates with the gospel track that goes with the candy cane. And uh, you folks helped us with that last year. And if you want to do that again this year, uh, that would be awesome. But you'd, you'd be surprised, just a pair of socks. I, I know on death row, we go there three or four times a year just to Angola. And um, uh, you're talking about 6,500 inmates and about 110, 112 on death row all the time. So uh, we minister to them, but some of them will say, man, I'm a, I'm a atheist, or I'm a Buddhist, or I'm this, or I'm that. And, and um, uh, you don't get too far with some of them, and that's okay. We just love on them and pray for them. And, uh, uh, but when we started giving out socks, wool blend socks and candy canes six years ago, uh, it opened doors, just a pair of socks. Wow, this is for me. Man, because they get the white, little white, institutional thin socks that really don't keep your feet too warm on the, on the concrete floor, and doors would open, and we could visit with them and talk with them and lead, you know, some to Christ. A um, couple of things you might not know about Angola, uh, New Orleans Southern Baptist Seminary has been in that prison for over 20 years now. When Warden Cain came there, it was a bloody, bloody, bloody prison. Uh, the inmates that were there, that's a lifer prison. Only 8% pastor leave the prison. If you go to Angola, you're doing life without parole. And uh, their cemetery, uh, they have two of them. They look like many Arlingtons with the little white crosses with, with numbers on them instead of names. But uh, when the new warden came, Warden Kane, he was packing the Word, okay? And he gave him Jesus. There's five churches inside that prison today. 
and uh, evangelism runs rampant. Uh, the inmates that graduate from the seminary, four years, and they don't do it to impress the parole board because there is no parole board. Uh, they do it to learn because they become Christians. And those men who graduate from the four-year seminary are ordained as assistant chaplains. Wow. And then their job in the prison is Bible studies. There's four chaplains on death row, inmate chaplains that minister to others. Now other prisons in Mississippi and Louisiana are asking for those inmates that have graduated uh, to come to their prisons and start Bible studies and ministry. And it's an unheard of concept, but guess what? It's working because there's no rehabilitation without redemption. There's no reform without rebirth, folks. And our, our wardens and our, our uh, directors of uh, prisons in all of our state, they need to realize that we've got to get God in the program, amen? If you will, uh, look with me, if you will, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. You'll find this in Deuteronomy. You'll find it in the book of Numbers. Uh, right at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, here's what God says. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning with verse 6, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And guess what? He's still delivering people today out of that Egyptian bondage, okay? From the land of bondage and setting people free. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any carved or graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them for I am the Lord thy God and I am a jealous God visiting, now listen to this, visiting the iniquity or the sin of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them who hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands and thousands of them who love me and keep my commandments. Wow. I am a product of generational sin. My grandfather was in the penitentiary, died an alcoholic, he abandoned his family, uh, went to Alaska for the gold rush many, 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 many years ago and died there. We don't even know where he's buried. Uh, my dad was in the penitentiary at Walla Walla, Washington, also died an alcoholic. Uh, in his 50s, died young. I was drunk with my dad. I was 18 years old, drunk with my dad the day my dad died, okay? I'm third generation convict, okay? I grew up in Danbury, Webster, Wisconsin. My mom and dad had a bar in Superior for a while. My grandmother was the matriarch of our family. Uh, she had the money. Uh, she uh, controlled the purse strings. And uh, if you drive between Webster and Siren, as you cross the Yellow River on Wisconsin Highway 35, it's pretty well, it might be even gone by now, but caved in was... was um, uh, uh, dance hall and beer joint called Oak Grove. Uh, my grandmother built that and owned it for 21 years. We owned a liquor store in Frederick. We owned a liquor store in uh, uh, Webster. And we were in the liquor industry business, okay? Uh, my grandmother was the only one in our family who didn't drink. Because she knew alcohol could ruin you. But she knew there was a lot of money to be made selling alcohol. And that was the business our family was in. Um, things were good when I was a little boy. When I was a real little guy, things were good. We had new cars every year. My dad had a Piper Cub and he had a Cessna uh, at the airport in Siren. And I uh, got to fly a lot with my dad. And it was, it was really good times. And... Um, my mom and dad drank more and more and more and finally became full-blown alcoholics. And being a bartender, uh, my dad ended up having a lot of girlfriends. And uh, things began to go south at our house, and there was a lot of fighting, and, and there was a lot of pushing and shoving. And my house became a dangerous place to live. 
But about 300 yards from our house was Grandma's house. And man, I'd cut a path through the woods and things got bad. Uh, Grandma loved me. And I was an only child and an only grandchild, okay? So my Grandma loved me. And she knew I was being abused and kicked around and getting welts on my body from getting hit with fly swatters and belts. Uh, uh, She'd put her finger in my dad's face, her son, say, don't you hurt this little boy. And uh, uh, I'd go to grandma's house, and grandma's house was my safe place. It was a good place to be because grandma loved me. And she baked good pies and cookies and And uh, as a little boy, uh, Grandma's house was my place of safety. But I began to get in trouble with the law when I was about nine years old in Webster. And uh, stealing, shoplifting, ditching school, breaking into lake homes. Uh, When I was 12, I stabbed a kid in the Webster school system. Uh, I was fighting a lot. uh, And that didn't happen in the 1950s, okay? Little boys didn't stab one another. Today they do. Today they'll shoot you, okay? But back then, it was unheard of. And so they sent me to the Wisconsin State Mental Institution for diagnostic evaluation. What's wrong with an 11, 12-year-old boy in so much trouble? Um, And uh, six weeks of uh, diagnostic evaluation. I escaped from there once. And they recommended after six weeks the uh, Wisconsin State Training School for Boys. Uh, and uh, I went to Waukesha, Wisconsin, and the average stay for boys in trouble, there was a bunch of us, eight, nine hundred boys there. Uh, if you said yes, sir, no, sir to the man, you didn't tattoo yourself, uh, did your schoolwork, you could go home in five or six months. But my dad taught me to be a non cooperative person, <laughs> that I didn't have to obey authority at all. I didn't have to obey the badge. I stayed two years. And what kind of shook me up? I I remember a kid came in with me the same day, and um, five months later, he went home. A couple months later, he came back. Five, six months later, he went home. A couple months later, he came back. Went home again, and I'm thinking, well, there's something wrong with this picture. So I started doing my schoolwork and, and behaving myself, and yes, sir, no, sir, and they let me go. My mom and dad had broken my grandmother's bank account, bad business deals, and, and literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars my dad lost in, in business ventures. And, and so my, my grandma retired, and my mom and dad had moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they were bartending at the Franklin Avenue Bar. Anybody on Franklin Avenue know where that's at? Well, that's a street bar. That's a gangster bar. And that's where the thugs uh, in Minneapolis hung out. And a friend of mine used my pistol one night to shoot another guy in there that we were looking for. Um, got him in the behind. It didn't kill him, but he couldn't sit down for a while. Uh, nobody called the police. It was that kind of a deal. And um, I caught a train. My dad met me at the train station in Minneapolis, and he was drunk. Welcome home, son. And um, same old, same old. My mom and dad were fighting. Uh, A lot of abuse going on. It was bad. My mother was a good Catholic and did not believe in divorce. Now, when my dad died, here's the day my dad died, and I was drunk with my dad when, when he died. We were drinking whiskey together, and uh, my mother said, I want you to make me a promise. Now, this is the hatred that was in our home. I want you to make me a promise. I said, sure, Mom. And uh, she said, when I die, and I'm probably going to die before you do, uh, I don't even want to be buried in the same cemetery as that you-know-what, because I hated your daddy's guts. I was a good Catholic. That's why I didn't divorce your dad. She said, you bury me in Danbury, Wisconsin. I don't want to be buried in Webster. Wow. I said, okay, mom, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, where my dad died, one juvenile judge, I knew him well. His name was Judge Bergen. Judge Bergen sentenced me 24 times as a juvenile 
delinquent. See, I was stuck in that curse, that generational sin, that curse. And uh, God says a little further over in Deuteronomy chapter 11, I've given you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you love me and, and keep my commandments, and a curse if you hate me and do not my commandments. And, and our family lived in that curse. And, and um, when I'm 19, I'm in a Mexican prison in Chihuahua, Mexico. Whenever, probably around the age of 18 or 19, whenever I was arrested and put in the back seat of a squad car, and I'd punch cops and, and uh, uh, spit on them, kick them, tried to shoot a police officer one night in Minneapolis. Uh, whenever I'd end up in jail, I'd sigh a sigh of relief because by the time I was 18 or 19, I was institutionalized. That generational sin got me big time. Drugs, alcohol, guns, partying all the time. Um, pretty sad. Pretty sad. I'd go to prison, and I was home. I was home. That was my house. Jail's where I lived. When, I, when I'd go to prison, <sighs> I'm home. Three hots in a cot. How sad. 32 arrests, 32 arrests. Now, you say, Richard, that's pretty bad. I've got one worse, okay? You ready for this? I don't think you are. Nobody ever told me about Jesus. That's worse than my life was. The mental institution didn't tell me about Jesus. Wisconsin State Reform School for Boys didn't tell me about Jesus. The psychiatrist and the psychologist didn't tell me about a Savior. Judge Bergen never told me about a way out. The correctional officers never shared with me. And I'm sure there was Christians among some of these people. The FBI came and got my partner and I out of a Mexican prison and and uh, I was in for interstate and international transportation of stolen vehicles. I'd been in that business for quite a while. Early on, Chop Shop. Uh, we had Chop Shops in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Omaha, Nebraska, and Sioux City, Iowa, where we could take stolen cars, get instant cash. Um, and that provided, you know, our drugs and alcohol and our party life. And then you just start over again. It was just a dog chasing its tail. But I uh, went to prison, uh, caught four years federal time, got a brand new name. My name in prison was 33476-115. They strip you of all humanity, okay? And, and your name is reduced to a number. It goes in a computer. And a bunch of people get a paycheck, man, off of you. And uh, did my time, got out, picked up a 10-year sentence, and went back. So what? I never looked beyond the, the concrete walls or the fences or the razor wire uh, or the steel bars. I never looked beyond that for another life. I never looked beyond that for education. My form, last formal education uh, uh, was, you know, the fifth grade. That was it. And I started doing time after that. Uh, Got my GED in a federal prison when I was 25 years old, okay? Uh, I never looked beyond uh, the prison walls for, you know, a, a different kind of livelihood. I mean, I was stuck. And, again, institutionalized. Until March 16th, 1969. Now, by this time, we had a new warden. One man, one man. And just think what one man, one woman, one teenager, one young lady can do. Uh, the warden we had hated us. We rioted on him once. We did $45,000 worth of damage to our prison in less than an hour. It was bad. Uh, several correctional officers got hurt and got medical retirements. Uh, and it was good cop, bad cop. Uh, the good correctional officers that respected us, they got protected. The inmates protected them from other inmates. But the cops that hated us, the correctional officers that did not like us, they got hurt. And they shipped that warden out. 
And they had another warden in the, in the federal system that wherever they had a problem institution, they'd send this man. His name was Noah Aldridge. And he'd been a warden for about 30 years. And they sent him to El Reno uh, Federal Reformatory. And uh, again, when, when he came, he was packing. He had a sword, the Word of God. And he made sure 1,200 inmates heard about Jesus almost every day. He was a Cumberland Presbyterian man. He loved Jesus and he loved us in spite of our sin, in spite of our lifestyle, okay? He loved us. And uh, he made personal trips to Oklahoma City and Enid, Oklahoma, uh, and recruited uh, church folks, Christians, uh, to come in and uh, provide monthly services. And, and before long, we had church, they were, we had chapel every night of the week, and multiple times on weekends. And that warden made it uh, his goal to witness to all 1,200 inmates, to share Christ with them. And I remember the day I was out in the yard, and I had never heard of Jesus. He was a cuss word in my vocabulary. God was a, a curse word in my vocabulary. I had no idea who Jesus was. I, I was spiritually ignorant. Satan did a good job on me, and I had no idea he existed, Okay. And I remember the day on the yard, the warden stopped me. He said, young man, uh, I'm your new warden. And I said, yes, sir. We'd already nicknamed him the righteous warden. And our institution began to calm down. While he was our warden, we had no murders and we had no stabbings. Isn't that amazing? He was there three and a half years. And our institution calmed down because of his influence, uh, you know, uh, concerning Christ. And uh, he said, young man, what's your name? I said, Richard. He said, where are you from? I said, northern Wisconsin, Minneapolis. Got a family? No, everybody's gone except my mom and my grandma. They're the only ones alive. And uh, do you write to them? I said, well, my grandma every week, my mom and I, we're just not close. And haven't heard from my mom in a year or so. And uh, he said, well, you ought to build a, try and rebuild that relationship with your mom. And I said, yeah, we'll see. And he said, by the way. He said, I love you, and I care about you, and I got a God who loves you, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he said, I I'd like for you, we have two morning services uh, at the chapel, and the uh, early service at 8, and then another service at 10. I'd like to see you there. My wife and children and I, we, we come to the early service, and then the, the second service, we go into the Presbyterian Church in El Reno. And I said, well, I've never been to church, and don't plan on starting now. But here's another kicker. See, I, we were all baptized church members. Everybody. Here's how Satan tricked us. I was a baptized Irish Catholic at birth. I was supposed to die. My mom had had some stillborn children, and I was supposed to die and, and, and probably not live very long. So my mom had the, the priest there in, in uh, Vancouver, Washington, where she was building warships in 1944. And man, I, I got baptized. I, I just come through the birth canal. I was all wet. And, and they got me again, okay? And uh, so I was Irish Catholic. My mom was Irish Catholic. My dad was German Lutheran. Uh, one of my grandpas was uh, Greek Orthodox. Another one was German Lutheran. I think maybe uh, uh, there might have been a, another one or two in there, but no Christians, Pastor. We had religion, and I hope you're not in that boat today. We had religion without a relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ. God has not called you and I to religion. Okay? Religion is the enemy of the cross. Religion, as we know it today, is the enemy of Jesus Christ. God wants a relationship with us in sonship and daughtership through His Son, Jesus Christ. And even though we had a family Bible that I don't ever remember being opened, I didn't know what Christmas was all about. I didn't know what Easter was all about. Uh, I've, you know, and, and of course, everybody was, you know, God bless you, or, you know, we're praying for you, and what have you. But there, I, I never heard Jesus Christ come out of anybody's mouth in a spiritual way. 
Well, March 16, 1969, a little about 48 and a half years ago, I uh, ventured over into church. Uh, about 43 world people came for the warden's one day revival meeting. And uh, eight in the morning till eight at night, singing, Bible studies, teaching, preaching, singing. And uh, uh, the men that met us at breakfast from the street, I remember two men, they happened to be Baptist deacons. They sat at my table and they came in monthly. And uh, they, I remember they told us, guys, we love you. We care about you. And they kept reiterating that, you know. And Jesus didn't mean anything to me, but that word love got to me because I didn't love anybody. I didn't love myself. I'd look on my stainless steel mirror in cell block six, and I knew I was a broken man. Nobody could fix me. Couldn't fix myself, man. And um, uh, they said, we love you guys. We care about you. Why don't you join us at church this morning? Uh, well, I, my, my Sundays are pretty full, but play baseball and lift weights and do drugs or whatever. And I went to church for the first time in my life. They brought a couple ex-cons with them that had been in prison ministry. One did 18 years, one did 10, and shared how Jesus set them free in prison. They didn't get to walk out the front gate, set them free on the inside. And, and the rest of their time was serving Christ, and prison became their mission field. Wow, I'm listening to this. And um, the singer sang about Jesus. We broke up into Bible studies, and all of a sudden it was noon. The warden catered a barbecue lunch for us. 160 inmates involved that day, and uh, I was only going to stay an hour, and here it was noon. Boy, God began to get a hold of my heart. The Holy Spirit began to get a hold of my heart, and I'm listening. Wow, is this stuff real? Is this Bible business really, really, really true? And about three that afternoon, I started crying, and I was a non-crier. When that barber cut my ponytail off, I said, I want a flat top, get down there real close. And, and when he was on top of my head with that uh, machine cutting my hair, uh, he said, my God, man, what happened to the top of your head? I said, well, that's from the war. And I was plenty old enough to have been in Vietnam. He, and that's what he said, Vietnam? I said, no, the war with the Minneapolis Police Department. That's 38s and 357 Magnums and big old wooden batons because I fought the cops all the time. They were my enemy. If you're a street guy and a street criminal, you know, police are your enemy, you know. And, uh, man, I got, boy, crevices and, man, stitches and like you wouldn't believe. And, um, uh, but I never cried. Broke my jaw, broke my nose, broke my elbow, kicked in ribs, but you wouldn't see a tear, you know, because I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. So I thought. I started crying. Because that day I'd realized I'd been sinning against a holy and righteous God. I realized that for the first time in my life, folks. And I began to weep. And I, and I didn't like weeping because, you know, you don't do that in prison. And, and I had some of my partners there. And they probably saw me crying. And, you know, that pride, the middle letter of pride is I. The middle letter of sin is I. What's our biggest problem? I. The big eye always gets in the way. But I'm crying, and I could, it was alligator tears, and I couldn't stop. About that time, they gave an invitation. Forty free world people that came to visit us that day from different churches all over Oklahoma stood across the front. Our chapel, a little bit bigger than the size of this church. And um, uh, they gave an invitation. If you're, you know, you got health issues, we'll pray with you, we'll pray for you. If you got family members you're concerned about, let us, let us help you. We'll, we'll show you scripturally, you know, answers to your uh, problems today. And, if, and then if you need to know Christ as your Savior, uh, we want to help you today most of all. I've been under so much conviction for a couple hours. And I'm sitting way in the back. And man, I was the first inmate out. You couldn't have held me back. I had to know Jesus. I had to have some relief from my lifestyle. 
uh, for the first time in my life, I got a good look at myself and I said, oh my God, where am I going? I'm going to hell, man. And I didn't even know it. And I, I came and the, the two men that, that had bre- breakfast with uh, us at our table were standing right there and, and they remembered my name and they said, Richard, how can we help you? And I said, uh, man, I don't know. I guess I need to know Christ as my Savior, man. My life's messed up. And, I, you know, I'm almost 25 years old. And, man, I've never heard this before. But, and I had a mustard seed of faith. Amen. Not much, but a mustard seed will get you in. Amen. Amen. And uh, I said, I guess I want to know Christ as my Savior. And uh, Claude, one of the deacons uh, that were there that day, he, said, he opened his Bible to John 3.16. And he read it like this, for God so loved Richard, he took the word world out. For God so loved Richard that he gave his only begotten son that if Richard would believe in him, Richard would not perish, but Richard would have everlasting life. See, I always knew there was a God. I always believed in God, a God out there somewhere in the universe. He did all of this. He did the mountains. He did the seas. You know, he did the Gulf of Mexico. He did all this. He brings the snow. He brings the summer. I knew there was a God out there that did all that. When the God out there that did all that becomes your personal God in Jesus Christ, your life changes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man, woman, boy, or girl be in Christ, they're a brand new creature. Old things passed away. All things become new. If you've never had a change, you've never been saved. See, when Jesus comes in, there's a change in our stinking thinking. Uh huh. There's a change in the way we see things and hear things. There's a way, a change in our walk. There's a change in our talk. Oh, if that's never happened to you, you better check your whole card. Okay? Yeah. You need Jesus. And uh, then they took me down that famous Roman road, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 through 13. I'm still crying. Richard, what would you like to do? I give my life to Christ. And they put their hands on me and prayed for me. And then I just said, Jesus, I'm a broken guy, man. Nobody can fix me. Can't fix myself, but I understand that, that you were born and lived and, and then died for my sin and, 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 and you were buried and on the third day rose from the grave to fix broken people, broken by sin. And Jesus, I need somebody to fix me, come into my life. Well, 48 and a half years ago, simple little prayer. Asking Jesus in to fix me. And guess what? It worked. Amen? Amen? I can't explain all the uh, theology to you, and, uh, but I was in a dark, dark place, and the light switch went on. woo Praise God. Well, I just became a hog, man. I mean, I started reading the Word. My boss uh, let me off. Uh, I was the only inmate out of about 1,200 inmates who, after lunch, got to go back to a cell, the only inmate in that prison, and study the Word, and studied the Word, and studied the Word, and memorized verses, and completed Bible study courses, and, and pretty soon prison became my mission field. And I was sharing Christ with other inmates, and the chaplains were using me, and I'd volunteer for chapel service, finally made parole, and, and uh, I was just moving from one mission field to another uh, in Oklahoma City. And, and uh, uh, I knew I couldn't go back to Minneapolis. All my buddies were heroin addicts and messed up. And I, had, I, I couldn't go back. I applied for an out-of-state parole, which you very seldom get. Within two weeks, I got an answer from the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Parole plan approved. And, and Claude, the deacon uh, that led me to Christ, uh, uh, had an apartment waiting for me and, and gave me an old car and, and discipled me and, and helped me and, and taught me more about witnessing. And uh, I got in a church. Uh, we were the largest church in Oklahoma, 15,000 members. And uh, it was an exciting church with outreach everywhere. And, and it was, I, I helped them get a prison ministry started out of there. And 
and uh, ended up getting married and having a little, uh, a little girl and adopted a little boy that's half white, half Native American. And uh, uh, times were, were good. And then my wife left. And I ended up getting a divorce. And, and, uh, but I got custody of my kids. And she had to pay me child support. Now, that doesn't happen very often, okay? Uh, but I, I was a single dad for a couple of years and met the lady I'm married to now, Phyllis. We've been married 31 years, and she brought two kids into the picture. Uh, her husband had died of a heroin overdose. And um, uh, we got a, a blended family. But you know, you hear preachers sometimes say, you know, give your life to Jesus, and it's going to be roses until you meet the Lord and go to heaven. And Well, that didn't happen. Uh, how many of you remember what happened on April 19th, 1995, Oklahoma City? My daughter was 22 years old at the time. Took her little babies to the Murrah Federal Building Daycare Center. And they were two and three years old. If you're a federal employee, and my daughter was, you can keep your children in the daycare center. America's Kids Daycare Center. Two black ladies ran it. And, and the kids learned, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they were Christian ladies and, and uh, teaching the kids about Jesus in a federal building, okay? And what they did, that's cool, okay? And, uh, uh, and that day, uh, they didn't come home. They went home. Nineteen little children went to be with Jesus that day. 168 people perished that day. Nineteen were innocent little children. Believe it or not, three little children lived through that carnage. My son was an Oklahoma City police officer at the time, and he was a rescue worker. And, and I remember he, he told me later, he said, uh, he said, Daddy, don't ever ask me what I saw as a rescue worker in the rubble. And he found one of his own nephews. And, and he later told me, uh, Daddy, uh, I'll tell you, whatever you want to know about me in the Marine Corps, when I was in the Marine Corps in Desert Storm, I'll talk about any of that, but don't ever ask me about the bombing and what I saw. Well, the old Richard Koss came back to life. I've been doing pretty good up until then, and I lost it for about eight months. I know none of you have ever been backslidden away from the Lord for more than five or ten minutes, you know. Eight months, I went down. I said, I'll figure out a way to kill one of those guys. Vengeance is mine. <laughs> I see some people shaking their head. Yeah, I've been there, Richard. Yeah. Vengeance is mine. And uh, get a cop haircut. I can get a cop uniform for him. Gerald Ford gave me a presidential pardon after I was out of prison five years, so I can buy guns, and I had a nice 45, and I'll just get a cop uniform, put my gun on, and I'll slip in when they're taking them from the courthouse, uh, you know, over to the, um, uh, back to the jail, or from the jail to the courthouse, I'll just slip in there as a, as a police officer, and boom, I'll get one of them. Vengeance is mine. Wow unforgiveness, bitterness, the root of bitterness. I was so miserable. And after about eight months of migraine headaches and horrible condition, God said, son, uh, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? <laughs> and I know all the verses on forgiveness. Yes, sir. Repent. Yes, sir. And I did. God lifted the migraines, got back on track, and then God said, now I want you to forgive Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. And I said, God, you're carrying this thing a little too far, man. <laughs> but I knew I had to. Now, let me bring you to this point. And I began to witness to those guys. Witness, my grandma was easy, got out of prison, led my grandma to the Lord immediately. She was 80 years old. I said, Grandma, are you a Christian? Remember, only three of us left. Everybody else died in alcoholism and cigarettes. Uh, Grandma, are you a real Christian? Here's what she said. Listen to this, Pastor. She said, no, son, I'm not. I've just been a baptized church member for 69 years. Wow. How sad would that be to die without Christ having been a church member for 69 years? die and go to hell. 
of your own choosing. And grandma was easy. She gave her life to Jesus, okay? Uh, in my car, I took her to a, a, a church service in Grantsburg, was taking her home, and pulled off the side of the road and began to witness to her. And I'm a hot rod guy. I like old cars, antiques, and hot rods. I've had a lot of them, 57 Chevys, 32 Ford Roadsters. I've had them all, and that's kind of my hobby, and I play with those things occasionally. And um, uh, I led her to the Lord in my 55 Buick. Four-door hardtop with mag wheels and dual pipes, man. That was a good place to get saved, give your life to Jesus. My mother was a different story. Fourteen years. She was a Vatican one, 40-year alcoholic. And her priest didn't give her a whole lot of help because his name, this is not a joke, okay? His name was Father Sin with two N's. And he was. Now, if I was a preacher and my last name was S-I-N-N, I'd go down to the courthouse and get a name change. Matter of fact, I've been thinking about it anyway. How about, instead of Richard Koss, how about Lee, L-E-E, Love, L-O-V-E, Lee Love, and you could call me Brother Lee Love. <laughs> Fourteen years later, got to lead my mom to Jesus through Catholic gospel tracts from born-again Catholics. See, there are born-again Catholics. And I, I went to a Catholic bookstore and found their section on evangelism. Wasn't very big, just a little corner. But there were tracts and books just like you and I give out. Uh, not about Mary, not about the rosary. And I knew all the Mary prayers. My mother taught me, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now in the hour of our death. Holy Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. I knew all that. Just didn't know Jesus. I knew a little bit about the rosary. My, my mom had, but never did me any good. But the Catholic material about being born again in Christ, I began to give those to my mom. I said, from your Catholic friends. My mom gave her life to Jesus. Now, after about six months, are you ready for this? Remember the hatred in my family? And what she told me the day my dad died? Listen to this. Listen to this. She said, do you remember what I told you the day your dad died? I said, yeah, Mom. Sure do. Can't forget that. She said, well, because God has forgiven me my sins, I have forgiven your daddy. You can bury me in the cemetery at Webster, Wisconsin. And that's where she is, by my dad today. Wow. December 23rd, 1975, the President of the United States of America, Gerald R. Ford, took an interest in me and gave me a presidential pardon. And there's a, a lot to it, but in fact what he did was Richard David Koss, it is my privilege as President of the United States of Amer America to grant you an unconditional presidential pardon and all of your rights that you lost through criminal convictions are restored to you as if it never happened. And I saw it, had a Jew's signature on it. Not just the president's signature, had a Jewish signature on it. Do you remember who the attorney general was back then? Levi. Attorney General Levi. So I've got a pardon with the president's signature and, and, and attorney general Levi's signature. And I saw it, but it wasn't mine yet. I heard about it. I knew it was coming. There it was, but it wasn't mine. A transaction had to be made. From his hand to my hand. Amen. Amen. Yes. Now, how about the pardon from the king? It's the same deal. Sins forgiven and forgotten. You start all over again. The past is forgiven, forgotten, as far as the east is from the west. But a transaction has to be made. We've got a pardon that's 2,000 years old. A transaction has to be made from God's heart to our heart, Jesus. And 48 and a half years ago, I saw that pardon, and I didn't have to hear it again. Didn't have to wait a month. Didn't have to wait, well, let me check this out a year from now. Let me see where I'm at. No, the day I heard was the day I believed. Amen. Now, where are you at today? Huh? Are you a Christian? you know Christ is your Savior? 
Things probably would have been a lot different if somebody would have told me about Jesus when I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. But then, pastor, maybe I wouldn't have the ministry that I have today. He knows. That's right. He knows. So I, I wouldn't trade it. I, I'd probably have to do it the same way because today God's given me a jail ministry, a prison ministry, and, and motorcycles. We work with the street people and, and, and feed street people. And, and just, man, it's just awesome. And I get to travel to other countries and, and do construction work and medical missions. And it's just awesome seeing people in third world countries come to Christ. But where are you today? God saved the last three people in our family. And they're gone. I've already done their home goings, okay? Their memorials. And so my mom and my grandma and me are the only ones out of our family that are, that are going, that, that immediate family. But I've got a couple little grandsons waiting, Chase and Colton Smith, my daughter's little boys. Then God gave my daughter two more children, a boy and a girl, okay? And, um, you know, they're Christians. Now, all of our kids are saved, and, and most of the grandkids, now we got the little bitty great-grandkids uh, uh, coming up, and, and if God takes me home, I know the kids will keep the ministry going. They keep, you know, they'll win, they'll win those kids to Jesus. We've told them, if you don't lead your children and your grandchildren uh, to Christ, then grandma and grandpa will be there to lead them. Amen? Yeah. What do you need from God today? You have not because you ask not. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Wow. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to ask Donna to come and maybe play something on the piano for a time of invitation. And your pastor is here. Others are here. Most of all, do you know Christ as your Savior? It's so simple. God has not made anything hard, but a transaction has to be made. There's Jesus. From God's heart to our heart. Invite him in. We'll show you scripturally what it means to be a Christian. Very simple, okay? Whosoever will may come. I found out, you know, 48 years ago, I was a whosoever. And boy, I was glad, too. And, uh, but what do you need from God? You got trouble in your marriage, trouble in your family. You got kids that aren't in yet. The altar's open. If you want to come and pray. If you need to know Christ, pastors here, myself. Others are here. I'm sure they'll get alongside of you and help you. What do you need? Come on. Would you respond today? I know in a crowd this size, there's people who need Jesus. I know that. Remember, the middle letter of pride is I. The middle letter of sin is I. What's our biggest problem? I. Come on. Number one. Is there one? Come on. What do you need from God today? What do you need from God today? This is my buddy Dietrich. I've known Dietrich a long time. He loves the Lord. Escaped the gangs of California. Moved up to Ashland to get away from that old crowd so he could have some freedom. Got saved out there. How about you? Come on. How about two? Maybe you're number two. The altar's open. You can come and pray right here. Amen. Got two. How about three? Where's number three? What do you need today? What do you need? I want to speak to my church, those of you that hear me on a week in and week out basis. Um, Richard, stay, stay up here. Um, you couldn't have a man more different from me. I didn't hear the F word until I went in the Marines. My parents were church-going people, easy people. But something Richard said today, just he needed to know a holy God. It wasn't until he recognized that there was a holy God that he had sinned against. That's the door of grace. That's the door of grace, to recognize you are a sinner before a holy God. And apart from what he do, does for us, you will never be free. And the other thing that my brother said today that blessed my heart was to know how weak we can get sometimes and we backslide. But we come back the same place. 
There's only one place, and that's the cross. That's the only place to that's go. It. Amen. So if, you, you're, if you're that place and you're backslidden and you need to get right with God, this is a place for you as well today. Father, I just thank you for my brother. So we're going to be up here praying with these brothers and, that are up here. If you want to come on up, pray, and then uh, we'll close the service here in a few minutes. Just bear with us. Got some folks doing business with God. Don't let this opportunity slip by. What do you need? He wants to hear from his children. I need thee every hour. That's the truth of the matter. Amen.